This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I'm Hermione Lee and I'm chairing this event, um, celebratory event for the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. Um, and I'd like to thank all the team at OUP uh, who have set this all up. And uh, I'd like to thank also the many contributors uh, to the DNB, without whom it wouldn't exist. I think a number of whom uh, are here uh, tonight. And of course, uh, the panel, who I shall come to in a moment. The format of the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, uh, as you will know, uh, is to start each article with a one-word profession, as in apothecary, landscape painter, organist, baron, conspirator, uh, bus operator. Some entries are allowed two professions, as in gun maker and radical, physician and social reformer, clergyman and satirist. And some even have three, as in soldier, diplomat and royal counsellor. When, in what I hope will be the far-off future, the ODNB articles for tonight's eminent panellists. <laughs> Each of them will need at least two professional descriptions, possibly three. All three are notable and distinguished British historians. All three, in their different spheres and institutions, are generous, committed, and influential professional colleagues. And all three, of course, which is why they are here tonight, are, or have been, editors of the ODNB. Professor Sir Brian Harrison, who's sitting in the middle there, who I'm sure you all know, FBA, Emeritus Fellow of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, is widely known for his work on British history, <coughs> notably his important volumes in the new Oxford History of England, Seeking a Role, the UK, 1951 to 1970, and Finding a Role, the UK, 1970 to 1990. He edited the ODNB in the crucial years between 1999 and 2004, and I know from personal observation how meticulous, dedicated, and clear-headed he was in that world. His future ODNB entry will include also a knowledgeable passion for architecture and music. Professor Lawrence Goldman, sitting on my left, fellow of the Royal Historical Society, took over the ODNB from Brian in 2004 and has been the general editor for 10 years, during which time the ODNB moved online. He's a fellow of St. Peter's College, director of the Institute of Historical Research, and an ambassador for the Workers' Education Award Association. He writes on 19th and 20th century British, American, and German social and political history, on adult education, and on science, politics, and culture in Victorian Britain. He's written biographies of Henry Fawcett and R.H. Tawney. Professor Sir David Canadine, FBA, is the Dodge Professor of History at Princeton and visiting professor in the Faculty of History at Oxford. His many books include The Decline and Fall of the British Aristocracy, Ornamentalism, How the British Saw Their Empire, Making History Now and Then, and The Undivided Past, History Beyond Our Differences. He's written Lives of G.M. Trevelyan and Andrew Mellon. His sphere of cultural influence in this country is so wide, from his ex-chairing of the board of the National Portrait Gallery to his current chairing of the Wilson Foundation Arts Panel, that I have to remind myself that he's actually in Princeton. There seem to be two of him, <laughs> several of him. He'll have several entries in uh, <laughs> And it is in part to celebrate his taking on the general editorship of the ODNB this year that we are here tonight. We're going to talk about the history, the character, the purpose, and the future of the ODNB, and I imagine somewhat about the experience of being in charge of this mighty national project. As the only non-historian here, perhaps I should start with a few key dates, just as an Ed memoir. <coughs> Um, and uh, I apologise if you already have these imprinted uh, in your inner minds. The publisher George Smith thought up the idea of a British dictionary of biography and started planning it in 1882. <laughs> Leslie Stephen edited it from 85 to 1891 when he retired overwhelmed and gave it up to his co-editor Sidney Lee, who thrived in the role until 1912. 
OUP took over the DMV from Smith and Elder in 1917, and throughout the 20th century, kept it in print, published supplements, and added articles. In 1975, OUP published a two-volume compact edition, and in 1996, OUP published the contents of the, D of the DMV up to 1985 on CD-ROM. In 1992, the delegates to the press agreed that there should be a new edition of the DMV. Colin Matthew started to edit what was then called the new DMV, for which OUP had financial support from the British Academy with an advisory committee chaired by Sir Keith Thomas. The new DMV, which was then renamed the Oxford DMV, took shape under Colin Matthew's clear and inspired guidance. His sudden death in October 1999 was a great blow to the project, but it continued securely and on time under the editorship of Brian Harrison, and the ODMB was published in 2004. That takes us up to 10 years ago, so uh, I won't give you any more history, but I do want to, before we start our discussion, cite three brief quotations from two of the DMB's previous editors. Two of them, the first two, are from Leslie Stevens. The first quote is from his essay on biography of 1893, where he says, the most amusing book in the English language is the Dictionary of National Biography. <laughs> <laughs> There's a challenge. <laughs> and this is my second quote from Leslie Stevens, and, and it's from his essay on national biography. The dictionary writer, he means, uh, the contributor to the DMV. The dictionary writer is not to pronounce a panegyric upon heroism, but he ought so to arrange his narrative that the reader may irresistibly be led to say bravo. <laughs> also a bit of a challenge. And the third quotation is from Colin Matthew, and it's his from, from his 1994 notes to notes for contributors. Its purpose, that of an article in the DMV, is to give a complete and balanced account of the life and work of its subject by supplying both detailed personal information and a general assessment of the subject's significance. Sounds very clear and very simple, but actually it is also a third challenge. Uh, so I do think those three quotations suggest some of the potential contradictions and, and challenges within uh, the DMV. So I thought we might start uh, by talking about a bit about the history, the origins and the history uh, of the DMV. Why was it set up? What were its aims? Why was it felt to be needed? Why did it come into existence at all? So, Brian, I wonder if we could start with you on that theme. Well, when it was given by the family, the, the um, Smith family, to, to the OUP, the dictionary was a sort of albatross or a white elephant, really. And I think the press worried about it. They weren't particularly eager to uh, exploit it. And the trouble was, during the 20th century, it was getting more and more out of date. Um, the existing entries were uh, being superseded by subsequent research. Um, more and more people were dying and were getting into supplements, but then there were so many supplements, how on earth did one use them? It was, it was an extremely difficult situation, really. But um, salvation really arrived with the internet and, and the computing arrangements became available initially for the OED and then for the DNB in the uh, late 80s. And um, Colin Matthew saw the opportunity with considerable vision, actually, um, and getting the whole thing computerized from the start was something really on a brave decision. But Brian, um, going back to the beginning, can, uh, why does it exist? Why was it, why was it needed at all? Um, well, there's uh, a, there's a, yeah, sorry, yeah, well, I mean, there's a serious and uh, a humorous answer to that. The serious answer is it's an age of national dictionaries and mm. biography. The British dictionary, uh, the DNB, is by no means the first. We're, we're, <coughs> we're rather late in the um, uh, construction of a national pantheon. Uh, the Germans were ahead of us, the Belgians were ahead of us, the French were ahead of us, and so forth. And there's this kind of sense in which, in an age of nationalism, you have to construct the nation by remembering its famous sons in the main, occasionally daughters. And so there is a kind of um, a tradition in, in the 19th century of building these libraries of, of dictionaries, if you like, uh, which define the nation. So that's the sensible answer. But the, the, the slightly flippant answer is Leslie's 
uh, Leslie Stephen was a problem to his publisher. George Smith... <laughs> Not only to his publisher. No, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> George, George Smith was, was um, uh, the publisher of the Cornhill, and Leslie Stephen, having left Cambridge, was the editor of the Cornhill, and it was becoming more sombre and serious as Stephen became more sombre and serious, as we know from uh, his daughter's uh, memoirs. And um, uh, he had to be shifted because the readership was going down. So Smith thought, ah, here's a good idea. We'll, we'll, we'll get him to do a dictionary of everyone who lived in every civilization. <laughs> uh, that will really keep him occupied and out of my head. It's quite an elaborate, uh, it's quite an elaborate idea just to kind of keep one of your authors quiet. That's right, uh, absolutely. But Stephen, of course, you know, he, he wasn't a fool, and he realized that actually that would be a little bit too big. So he said, let's just stick with, with Britain. So it's a, it's, a, it's a patriotic, It's in its inception, it's a sort of patriotic enterprise. Ah, uh, no, I think a liberal imperialist. I was, imperialist. Yes, I mean, I, I think Stephen, you know, he came from a long line of, of, of you know, this anti-slavery, evangelical Stephen family. I mean, I don't think he did it for patriotism. He spoke often of the need for a reference work, a simple reference work that would give you the facts and the details. But, uh, but as you describe it, there is a sort of nationalist impulse behind it, David. It's interesting that one way of thinking about it is in the context of other dictionaries in other countries. That's one of the things the British took great pleasure in celebrating was that unlike some others which were state-sponsored, this was a private enterprise, enterprise, even though of course it lost lots of money, but it was thought to be a sign of a free and energetic people that it wasn't state-sponsored. But of course, another context is indeed the quite complicated cult of the nation and of heroes, which I think was never quite as simple as some people want to think, because of course if one takes the period from the 1850s to the 1880s, in Britain, it's not just the Dictionary of National Biography, it's the National Portrait Gallery, and it's the Blue Plaque Scheme here in London. Entirely by chance, I've had connections with all three of them, so I'm very hopeful that my narration will be varied um, when my time comes. <laughs> the founding document of the National Portrait Gallery says defects of character are not a reason for refusing to accept images. Um, and I have to, have to hand this quotation from Sidney Lee, I think, about the uh, Dictionary of National Biography. Malefactors whose crimes excite a permanent interest have received hardly less attention than benefactors. Yes, well, that's a fa fabulous uh, quote to, to get us on to the question of, you know, I mean, Brian, you've talked uh, very illuminatingly about how it started and how it's, you know, developed. But what, what, if any, were the principles of inclusion uh, when it first began? I mean, Brian, I think you Well, uh, I disagree with Colin about quite a number of things, but I did never disagree about his approach to dictionary, which was fairly Catholic and wide, actually. And he was a political historian coming into social history. I was a social historian coming into political history. We met in the middle. And, um, I always thought that his very wide view of who should be included in the dictionary uh, was dead right. And I also greatly agreed with um, his computerization of the whole planning <coughs> thing. One person who's in the room now who ought not to be forgotten is Robert Faber, who was a sort of dynamo behind the whole thing, or organizational group genius in my view. Um, and he was there all the way through. Um, and um, one shouldn't forget the extraordinarily powerful machine it was. I, I was overwhelmed by it. When I first went to the dictionary as editor on the 16th of December 1999, I remember it very well. It was like starting at school again. Um, there were all these people in all the, it, the building we had in St. Giles was two stories and so there were people up at the top story and the middle story and, and down below, about 40 people there all looking down at me while I, I uh, made a sort no of introductory speech. No, and, um, no, I mean, what you've described very interestingly is the way in which individual characters have been so important yes. all the way along in this project, yes. including uh, all of yourselves. But I, I'd like to go back a just for a moment to this question about inclusion. You say that you met in the middle with Colin and that uh, yeah. there was this sense that you greatly appreciated this inclusiveness. Obviously one of the debates about the dictionary all along has been who's in and who's out. So do the, do the others of you feel that the inclusiveness, uh, before, we, before we even get to the new DNB, uh, in fact 
developed and changed from the early days? Or was the, was the motive always to be inclusive? Well, it's interesting because, I mean, although I think the original dictionary was, I mean, Stephen's dictionary had something like 30,000 individuals, which, given, you know, the state of Victorian historiography and the sort of, sort of uh, steam-powered world they lived in, uh, was quite a feat, you know, to have collected the materials for 30,000. So that was something. What's interesting is just to think about those supplements that Brian mm. talked about. Mm. Through the 20th century, these, these supplements um, that came out every 10 years, they were the weakling because, in fact, they very much underrepresented. Mm. They were not inclusive because you could only get about 700 biographies in one of those volumes for the 1920s or the 1930s. You had to be very great and very good to get into the DNB. Mm. Mm. And actually, a lot of the very interesting, colourful characters the ones got, that David yes, was they about. got left yes. out because you know they were they were generals and they were statesmen mm. um, and a few scholars as well. But you didn't get the malefactors and and the whole variety. Another character must not be forgotten is C.S. Nichols, who called herself C.S. Nichols because she thought that she'd gain greater respect if she was thought to be a man. Um, Those are the she, days. She, <laughs> she, she was co-editor co of several supplements, sure. or editor of supplements, and she's a link figure, really, between the old dictionary yes. and the new one. Yes. And I really, really don't think she no, should have got it. Well, point is well taken about the shift from the original Leslie Stephen and Sidney Dean scheme, because, of course, to, to the, the supplements, which really were much more than just the great and the good, because one of Stephen's criteria, or one of Stephen's areas of interest, originally, <coughs> was in people whom he described as either obscure or second rate. And he said it's the second rate people you want to turn to this dictionary for. All the first rate people have got amazing obituaries and monuments of Westminster Abbey and goodness knows what else. It's the second rate people that the dictionary is here to draw attention to. But he didn't mean that. It's so interesting, that thing, because Virginia Woolf takes that and calls yes. it obscure love. Yes. But he didn't mean by second rate, he didn't mean inferior, did he? He didn't mean half, no, not not terribly impressive. No, he meant uh, as we s mean when we say second ranking. He second meant rank. <laughs> second ranking significance. Mm. Yes, exactly, exactly so. Yeah. But those are the figures, back to Lawrence's <laughs> point, which went in the supplements because there just wasn't room. Right. But of course, um, that leaves aside a whole set of other questions <coughs> about what was the area of activity and achievement to which these different criteria of yeah. first rate and second rate applied, because of course there were large areas that were just well, not But that takes us to the politics of the whole project. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Is there a political agenda behind this project? Has there always been a kind of ideological agenda behind it, in terms of who you rank and how you rank them, who you include and who you exclude? It's rare to find that. I mean, I have been berated uh, once or twice in ten years, one person in particular, uh, who, uh, uh, no, no, uh, who, you know, who, who, who made what I think is, is the false claim, that this is a kind of establishment plot, uh, that it's dominated by males in the pages of the DNB, uh, and that essentially, you know, we replicate a certain style, it's coming from a university press in an ancient university, and there is a kind of focus on an establishment broadening slightly as we go into the 20th century and beyond, um, which I think I refute. Well, uh, how, how do you, in, in, in a in a brilliant epigram, how do you repeat Well, it goes, <laughs> I, I, epigrams aren't my style, but it goes back to benefactors and malefactors. I mean, um, in fact, the variety is there in Stephen's dictionary. Mm -hmm. The basis was always laid down that we should try to cover all, all types, uh, all human life was here. Um, uh, C.S. Nichols may have tried to pass herself off as a man <laughs> in, in that way, but I'd give a prize to the uh, uh, audience if they can pick out the number of uh, transgender um, uh, articles or individuals in Stephen's dictionary. There are quite a few people there who try to well, pass this into as transgender. Well, they were. <laughs> they they were. were yes. okay. So, I mean, you know, one, 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 I, think, I think it's fair to say that it's never had that kind of house style aiming to replicate an elite across its pages. No, but what it has had has been good writing, clear writing. Yes. I was always struck when I was editor of the dictionary that actually the contributors sent good stuff in. I, mean, I didn't have to torment it and mm. correct it. I always butter up your order. Let's <laughs> 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 on to the issue of, of how the things are written, which I do want to spend mm. some time mm. on. But can we just, just to fill in 
in the history so that we're, we're, we're up, up, we've come up to now. When the new DNB gets underway, the Oxford Dictionary, you know, which is then called the, the new DNB, when Colin Matty gets to work and then you take over, were there radical conscious shifts of intention and <coughs> principle, or was the idea continuity but enlargement, or continuity but more variety? I'd say continuity but more okay. variety. And certainly in my case, there was no divergence between me and Colin in right. what, what should go in. But as a young Turk, I went to okay. a seminar, Robert will, rem will remember this, sure. in about 1993, when Colin laid out his plan before a group of historians in Oxford. I had no idea where I'd end up, but I was just a young tutor. And I said, well, wait a minute, all this sort of organic growing of the dictionary, of the new dictionary grafted onto the sort of stem of the old dictionary, uh, essentially will give you a hybrid. It will give you a kind of Victorian dictionary turned into a modern dictionary. We should scrap the Victorian dictionary and we should write it all from scratch. We should not take anything on trust. It should be our view of the nation's history, not Leslie Stevens' view through a kind of but lens. But that didn't quite happen. No, and I remember you saying that. <laughs> 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 The, the press people said, mm, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> they took you away somewhere. <laughs> but David, coming in now, would you also feel uh, uh, like a young Turk, like Lawrence? Or, would you, or do you feel your job is, as it were, con con a continuity and preservation? Well, I used to be a young Turk a long time ago, um, <laughs> if I ever was one. So that's not, I think, um, an option. Um, I am interested in the fact that notwithstanding everything that's been said, and this is indeed the way it appears to work, there is a perception, as it were, uh, in the broader world that getting into the ODNB is the kind of final supreme establishment accolade. That seems to me not to be true. Um, and it's not true, obviously, because there are plenty of malefactors in who clearly are not in for an establishment accolade. And one of my first jobs coming up in January is going to be uh, defending the inclusion of a very good entry, in fact, by Lawrence on Jimmy Savile. Um, and I can already, uh, as you were here, uh, the people on the Today program saying, um, isn't this supposed to be about good people? Um, which is a coded way of saying, isn't it about the establishment? So what's this villain doing? Well, we had trouble with that murderer, that chap who shot, shot all the children in uh, Dunblane. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we had protests yes. on that. But I mean, the, the, as I understand it, although I, I have tried to find out what the criteria for inclusion and exclusion are, and nobody is willing to tell me. Someone here. You probably have to edit it for quite a long time. <laughs> so worn down by the labours in a Leslie Stephen like way that by the time you're told you can't do anything about it. I'm sure that's, that's But you've got to have a concept. It's not just stuff. No. I mean you've got to have a concept about this stuff. Well, well the theory is historic significance, which is of course the justification for Jimmy Savile. That's to say it's not about the great and the good, except in so far that some of the people who describe in those terms are historically significant. But of course, the notion of what is deemed to be historically significant uh, changes over time. Um, it's worth noticing um, that the percentage of women in the original dictionary and indeed in the dictionary that Brian signed off on uh, wasn't high. Um, it's still not high, but it's a great deal higher than it was. And now, whether that's because um, as it were a positive discrimination on the part of the editors, uh, or whether it's because as we move closer to mm. the present day, as it were, there are more women who are deemed to be historically significant, I'm not yet sure. No, there are women are there if you, if, you, if you look for them. I mean, you know, voluntary work, nurses, uh, health areas and so on, lots of women to be found there, it's just they didn't look for them. So uh, yeah. here's, a, here's one more question about the, the shift from the past to the recent present. You didn't get your way as a young Turk. Mm -hmm. They didn't throw the whole of the history away. They didn't start everything again. Many of the articles uh, are perhaps likely or heavily rewritten from the past, mm -hmm. but retain some of the original narrative. What, what was the <coughs> principle, I mean, any of you could answer this, about rewriting what's already there, rather than throwing everything away and starting again? Well, I think... I mean, if we go back to Colin Matthew, he had I mean, a profoundly sort of historical kind of cast of mind and a kind of organic sense of British history mm. growing, as it were. 
and also a, a sense which only someone like Colin, who was a great Victorianist himself, I mean, you know, one of the great Victorian scholars of modern times, he had this profound <coughs> respect for Victorian scholarship and what they, they had achieved. So I think Colin temperamentally was not the person to kind of throw the baby out. Um, but I think, you know, speaking practically, there are many figures in the dictionary about whom we know not a great deal more than they knew in the 1890s when they were being written. So how written. can they be rewritten? With a different tone, with a different approach, with a different political... Well, Colin did have a thing about historiography, didn't he? I mean, the, the subsequent, the, the, the post-death history of people, Princess Richard III, now, I imagine would have a big paragraph on the digging up in the car park in Leicester. <laughs> and, and Colin was always very really keen on that, and um, so was Sidney Lee, really, because there's a huge uh, historiographical section at the end of Shakespeare. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, one of the things that we can now do, because it's online, as well as between the yes. hard covers, is constantly update the entries. Yes. Um, and yes. that's sort of and one of the great... And as a reader, look between the, yes. the entries, yes. which is a wonderful thing. Yes. It's yes. a really fascinating historical exercise. Yes. Um, let, let's open this out into a bit more detail about uh, how, the, uh, how the editing and the writing uh, works. Uh, just going back to those challenges laid down by your predecessors, um, amusing, the most amusing book in the English language world, can it be and, and how could it be? The reader should be driven to say bravo. Well, should the reader be driven to say bravo or boo? Uh, complete and balanced, those two wonderful words in poems, complete and balanced, can it be? So those are some of the things that, that obviously as general editors you have to think about when you're, when you're um, commissioning the articles. Um, what makes the ideal article in the entry? I'm pondering at the moment um, the issue of um, my second big job after I've defended the inclusion of um, Jimmy Savile in the upcoming uh, new set of lives. Uh, well, what the next thing I'm opposition to Jimmy Savile. We'll come back to that. Well, <laughs> not yet, not yet, and I'm hoping to fend off whatever opposition there may be. So what's the what's the other one? The second challenge, <clears throat> which, as it were, in a, an appropriately larger than life way relates to these problems is that the next thing after defending the inclusion of Jimmy Savile is I have to think who to commission to write the life of Margaret Thatcher. And it seems to me that that throws up in a very stark form the tension, which I think on the whole very happily exists in the ODNB. And it's a tension that Colin alluded to in that quotation of his that you gave, that's to say, um, is it meant to evoke um, a personality? Uh, and or is it meant to offer an early assessment of historic significance? Mm. Now, those are not absolutely mutually exclusive activities, but nevertheless, it seems to me that there is, there is a kind of tension in the dictionary between articles which are strong on the first and articles which are strong on the second. Let me give examples of that. If one compares, in fact, the article on Churchill by Edgar Williams in the 1960s volume, with the article on Churchill by Paul Addison in the later volume, you get two very different approaches, and it's wonderful to read them off against each other. The Williams piece is hugely uh, moving because Williams went through the war and was a great admirer of Churchill's, and it's, as it were, the wartime generation's version of Churchill, very eloquently done. Um, whereas the Paul Addison piece in the more recent uh, dictionary places Churchill in a much more considered and on occasions critical historical perspective. Uh, and they are very different approaches. They are written, of course, 40 years apart. And so my, uh, as it were, challenge with Thatcher is, do I ask, as it were, Douglas Hurd or William Waldegrave or Chris Patton, uh, who would offer, you know, a vivid evocation of, as it were, a life with Marvel? <coughs> Um, might not be many jokes in that, but I don't know. <laughs> or do I go to a historian um, who would offer a more measured view of, as it were, Thatcher's real historical significance? Or do you go to the person who's already written the biography, which is something that often happens, yeah. I've noticed. So, and you Charles Moore would, of course, be... Version. Version. And yes. people have started writing Well, that's a very interesting... <laughs> 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 That's a very interesting, the Churchill comparison is very fascinating, that's a very interesting uh, example. Uh, uh, 
guys, what do you mm. think makes the ideal? What, what do you think the DMB article ought to do? As yes. a piece of well, I mean, I think your point about complete and balanced is interesting, but I think we are up against the limitations of the form, and we have to be <coughs> honest about this. In 1,500 or even 3,000 words, or whatever it might be, a major figure has to be sketched, and the result is that you know history will want to know what was most important about this person, and we may inevitably have to lay that down to the detriment of other aspects. Um, this came up, but it's not quite the grandeur of Churchill, in our um, uh, uh, updating of the dictionary with gardeners and horticulturists. Now you might think, where's he going with this? Uh, but it was a point made by um, one of the research editors, Mark Curtois, pointing out that many of the greatest politicians were also great gardeners. And yet if you read the great statesmen's um, biographies in the Dick NB, they concern matters of state. But the fact that they constructed a garden, you know, and often they did on their estates, was completely left out. So when we added the gardeners, and we found quite a few that we missed first time round, um, we also had to, in a sense, add a bit to an, some notable yes. politicians' yes, lives, absolutely. notable statesmen's lives, yeah. because you know there is a kind of sense in which when you withdraw from the affairs of state, you cultivate your garden. Well, and it's about hinterland. Isn't yes, it? precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, did you ever turn down an article because it didn't seem to you to sufficiently embody <coughs> the, the person or to be sufficiently historically no, no. I, I was a very diplomatic editor, <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, we, we were very good at making, um, uh, converting oh, sow's ears. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> right. But no, in general, seriously, I, I was struck with how well written most of I think a lot of people who have these fashions for writing obscurely because they think it's clever, didn't really think of, of cooperating with the dictionary. I, mean, I never saw any people. There's like no that. theory in the dictionary, is what you're saying. <laughs> 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 but you know, it's very, as, a, as somebody like many people here who writes biography, that I am very fascinated by the confines of the form because there are all kinds of things you can do in biography, such as give very rich, thick uh, historical context. Um, talk about minor characters in the person's life, go down those side alleys of friendships and connections and rivalries and all those things. And also, as some biographers do, go into quite a lot of psychoanalytical uh, supposition. And that's something which it seems to me, perhaps for reasons of space or perhaps for editorial preferences, that the DFB doesn't do very much. I think it's editorial preference where the psychology is concerned. I really do think right. that, that there is a tradition of editing this which uh, almost uh, um, uh, on principle stops psychological um, um, speculation. The interior world of our characters is something that we, we leave to others, if you yes. like. But if um, it was very yes. well done, then you accept it, would you? I mean, wasn't the philosophy one of every flower blooming? I mean, uh, if, if it's really well done... But I think that, in a way, from, from Stephen through the supplement editors to Colin and beyond, mm -hmm. I don't think there's ever been an editor who has actually wanted to focus on that interior world. I mean, obviously, in the larger articles, um, and in a case of Churchill, somebody who you know was aware of his own foibles, the mad dog and so, the black dog, uh, 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 <laughs> Floyd Smith. <laughs> <Floyd Inspector. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay, you know, yes, but I think most of the time, um, whilst the personal life is important yeah. to us, the, the wives and the mistresses and the children and so forth. Yeah. Uh, 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 we, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I <laughs> uh, indeed, um, we, we, we tended, at least I think we did, not to engage with, with, with right. as it were, the speculation. Well, now, why is that a good thing? I mean, you know. I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> it's also probably though that there's not much space, and I suppose most of the people are in because of their public lives. Mm -hmm. And that in the end, by the time you've done the public life in a thousand yes. words, but then, if it's interesting, there's not much. But then, aren't you? Isn't it then? I'm just to be devil's advocate for a moment. Isn't it then a very retrograde form of narrative that you're going back to, as it were, the standards of Victorian lives <coughs> and letters, where you can start yeah, all that? I agree with that. I think that's a terrible line. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, we were sort of chronicling public lives. I mean, we were trying to understand these personalities from inside and uh, create a rounded portrait. Um, and I'm sure you'll be doing the same. Mm. Yes. Well, I'm trying to think when I... Wrote... <laughs> <laughs> yes. When I wrote about Noel Adam, for example, which was enormous fun, and I was a fan of his, so it was not at all a critical piece, 
Um, though I did end up saying he was two Cambridge for Oxford and two Oxford for Cambridge. He <laughs> managed to cause equal offence in both places. <laughs> but I didn't have that many words, and I mean, Noel was a very formidable and rather wonderful personality, and I did the best I could to evoke that. But I did slightly feel that because, of course, it was an amazingly full life in terms of public accomplishment and achievement, that I was kind of adding this on and would have mm. liked to have had more mm. space. Mm. Well, of course, it's, it's limited. I want. I want to ask one more slightly sort of side-on question, but it's something so important to the, the new DNB, and you've already mentioned it in passing, David, which is the, the question of illustrations and images, mm -hmm. and the relationship <coughs> between the written text and the, and the illustration. And it's really an open question as to why you think it's so important to have that, this relationship that the new DNB does have with the National Portrait mm -hmm. Gallery, and, and why you think it matters to the images. Not, not all entries have images. Um. Well, I mean, it's a point that, that we've often made that as it stands, it's the largest collection of British portraiture that's ever been published. I mean, it's something like 11,000 images and growing. Um, and that is an achievement in itself. And all our collaborators there deserve, you know, our thanks. In fact, I mean, uh, the, I mean, the images add enormously to the enjoyment, I think, of writing the piece and indeed publishing the piece. But they're not without difficulty in choosing. I mean, um, sure. and that is obvious. I mean, mm -hmm. if you take a great life, uh, what period quite, <coughs> What period do you want to, to put the baby portrait? That's in right, you know. Um, and, um, uh, and, and we often, you know, puzzled in the office about which of a whole sequence we, we should choose. You know, um, I wrote the Queen Mother, and, and what do you do there? Do you do the Queen when she is Queen Elizabeth, um, or do you do actually the figure that we, that we we grew up with, that we remembered, which is, you know, the lady in her 70s and 80s? And it, it's not easy, and it probably does a disservice that we went for the, the Queen Mother. But why do we want to see, why do we want to see the images when we read a life? Why do we mind so much about wanting to see the images? Well, I suppose we're conditioned in part by obituaries, which normally yes. do have pictures, and again, often they look incredibly young in the pictures, and you wonder why they just die. <laughs> 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 but I suppose as a result, <laughs> acculturated to the notion that if you're reading about a life, there's got to be a mugshot, as it were. Yes, and sure. I mean, that doesn't exactly do justice to what has happened in the ODNB, and I do think that the, the images are an extraordinary innovation and a great accomplishment. But I think we actually like to know what the person looks like who we're reading about. Yes, it's true. And um, you talked a little bit about the challenges in the future in terms of those two entries, David, that mm. you're brooding on. Yes. Could you, perhaps before we open this out to questions, could you say a bit more on these others too about how you see uh, the future challenges for the for the new DNB? Will it exist in um, another hundred years' time? Should it? And how can it? Well, um, I suppose one can't commit one's uh, successors for that amount of time. It's a very Oxford University Press, as it were. But um, I'm very hopeful that it will still be in being. Whether the blue volumes will still be in being by then, um, I'm rather less sure. But mm -hmm. it seems to me that uh, the whole revolution that has occurred, in a sense, um, in the image and production and availability of the dictionary prior to being online, um, which Lawrence, as it were, did so much to uh, uh, embed, um, is by no means yet over. Uh, I think that um, the continuing uh, publishing online is going to be hugely important for revising past articles, for putting new articles out, for the enterprise being cross-searchable and so on in ways that were simply not possible when it was just between hard covers. And my guess would be at the moment that the future of the dictionary uh, as an online enterprise um, is actually a very exciting one. And I think we've only begun, barely begun, to exploit and explore the potential uh, for all sorts of searching and research that in fact would enable us to use the materials there in all sorts of new ways. And my guess would be that that will provide a kind of dynamic to the enterprise, which will certainly see all of us out. Well, it's just that there's another way of answering your question, which is to ask questions about the nation. A uh, hundred years from now, um, it's not altogether clear that the nation uh, that was covered in the DNB uh, up to this point will, will exist. And it's just an interesting point about Stephen's conception, 
the dictionary of national biography, never defining what that nation was. And uh, you know, jokes have been made about the insufferable arrogance of the British, who just simply called their dictionary of national biography that because everyone would know who it was about. It was the British, but it's not in fact that. I mean, it allowed Stephen, and it allows us to range across the British Isles and then across the empire, uh, and indeed wherever Britons have gone, uh, and include them, everyone, even those who wanted to escape from the empire, as it were, are in the DNB. But I think 100 years from now, it's not clear that the configuration of these islands would be the same. Um, and that will have it, some sort of impact on the way sure. the, uh, the dictionary grows. We were a bit worried about the Scottish referendum. <laughs> <laughs> For obvious reasons, in that if Scotland had become independent, um, I'm not quite sure what the implications of that would be. Would cut out a lot of us? Yes, we'd have been purged. <laughs> 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 well, how do you see the future? Uh, well, I'm, I'd like to know from Lawrence about the number of subscribers. <clears throat> I mean, presumably it's certainly been going up ever since 2004 through the public library system, has it? Yes, I mean, um, I mean, Philip is probably the man to ask about, about the hits on the website, the seven million or so hits. Um, uh, every year on the website. Um, the number of subscribers is actually quite small in the sense that there are not a great number of individual subscribers. Most people will access it through uh, institutional subscriptions. Yeah. But something like 20 to 25% of the hits on the website are via the public library system in Britain. And I think that's a tremendous uh, a statistic or, or, or factoid. Um, most uh, people who use it are uh, researching, if you if you like, yes. and you would be you wouldn't be surprised to know that the sort of key research universities in the English speaking world are those that use the dictionary most heavily. But it's great to think that something like a quarter of the hits come out of the public library mm, system. That's a great fact. Yeah. So yeah. one way of thinking about the nation in that sense, or what's the national bit of the dictionary of national biography, is on the one side, well, it's maybe a kind of pantheon with some baddies in as well. <coughs> But uh, one way of thinking about a consequence of the IT revolution is that it's now, in terms of audience, readership, more embedded in the life of the nation than ever before. Very interesting.